Hello, everyone. I hope you are all doing well, staying apart while keeping it together. I'm Sarah Conley, the Conservation Coordinator for the International Elephant Foundation. And for today's edition of the Ask a Conservationist series, we are very proud to have Mike Keglin. Mike is a founding trustee of the Uganda Conservation Foundation and first started working in Uganda in 1997. In 2016, Mike was awarded an MBE or member of the most excellent order of the British Empire for his work in conservation. IEF has supported the Uganda Conservation Foundation for over 10 years, working together to support the construction of 10 ranger stations, land and marine, and provide support for Murchison Falls and Queen Elizabeth National Parks. We are so proud to have Mike here with us today. Thank you so much and welcome. Hi there, how are you? Very good, how are you doing? Yeah, it's a nice warm evening in Kampala. Wonderful. How are things in this current global pandemic for you? Strange. <laughs> being being locked, in, locked up, so to speak, um, is not normal for any of us, I know. Um, Uganda is going through a tough time like everyone, but certainly not as bad as some of the world. So we're, we, we're very lucky. Um, the government has got us in lockdown and lots of people are recovering from the 80 odd who've had um, positive tests. So our, our risk is people coming in from Kenya and Tanzania really, rather than within the general population. But we're okay, we're okay. Good, let's hope it stays that way. You obviously aren't from Uganda. So what brought you to Uganda in the first place? When you were growing up in the United Kingdom, did you dream of running all the way to Africa and working with animals? We do have a strong family connection. Um, my mother was from Kenya and the family went back to the Kenya days of 1890, I think they went there. Um, and like many families in Kenya, um, my uncle had become a game warden in Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda during the 60s. So we had a connection. It was a long family history in East Africa and for a while within, within um, Uganda. Um, but yes, I was born and brought up within the UK. I was a, um, an army brat, as we'd call in the UK. My father was a soldier um, in, in a regiment called the Irish Guards, and um, all of my schooling was in the UK. Um, I didn't dream of becoming what I am today, I was going through the Royal Marines, um, which is another regiment in the UK. And um, one of the reasons why I came out here, in fact, was to decide whether to continue with the Royal Marines or to go to the Irish Guards, the family regiment, because many generations had gone to um, the Irish Guards. And I just wanted a break. So I went to come and see what my uncle had done. And yes, I'd always been fascinated in elephants and wildlife and East Africa, and but I'd never contemplated it as a career, I'm not even sure it is a career. I don't get paid for this, so is it a career? I'm not quite sure. Um, but it's it's been fascinating for 20 plus years. Um, horrific and terrific. Um, everything wrapped into it, it's been an experience, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, it's after university, I came out to Uganda and uh, and pretty much stayed, other than a little gap in the middle where I went back to the UK, did an MBA, joined Deloitte in, in, in their strategy group in London, and then in 2012 was asked to come back to Uganda to help in Murchison. So yeah, it's not a plan. No one would, would put this on a plan, a career path, but it is what it is. And, and uh, I've had some wonderful friendships with, with um, guys and girls working in the parks, and, and they're very special, and of course with the donors too. It just goes to show when it comes to conservation or animals in general people find a calling and it sort of doesn't matter what your plan is you end up where you're supposed to end up um, i think that's right and and when i was first in queen elizabeth national park this is going back to 1997 onwards um it was really a case of there were problems that i could solve and why wouldn't you solve them? They, they were things that were within grasp of sorting out, and some of it didn't require money. It just needed to be done. Um, 
And the more that happened, the more momentum built up, the more actually we're changing things. And it wasn't necessarily about, this is a wonderful elephant, or wow, what a lion, or I want to become famous. Not that I've sort of tried to do any of that or done that. Um, the key of it all was, I can turn this place around, but where are the others? Where, if people were really doing all of this, I wouldn't have bothered. Um, it was a total gap. Nobody was really getting to grips with what the real problems were. And, and eventually that's what created the, the challenges. Could I do it? Well, my mindset was like a Royal Marine. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Um, so do it. I love that attitude. You're right. You see a need and you feel like you can fill it and you jump right in and that sort of all the other considerations don't don't even happen. You just act, which is fantastic. Yeah. Uganda's had a tumultuous sort of half century politically. Uh, it's gone from, well, you can discuss sort of where it was and where it came to and where it is now. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit of Uganda's conservation story? You have to put it in context, as you, as you said. If you go back to how parks were created, in fact, the national park concept, I think everyone knows, comes from America, in fact, um, but a protected area. At the time of um, you know, the 1900s to 1950s was a time of huge change in Africa. Um, people were coming from around the world, as they had done for centuries before as well, and they were looking to trade all over the world, and Africa was one place where they were exploring and looking at opportunities or whatever, from all over, whether you're Portuguese, Spanish, German, French, English, whatever. And interestingly, Uganda had, um, has always had wonderful soil, wonderful rainfall, wonderful climate, and that meant that agriculture was just perfect. And before the national parks, agriculture was taking up everything, and quite rightly so. I mean, people around the world wanted food. Agriculture was a major industry. Why wouldn't that happen? Um, but then people also realized the, the wildlife needed to needed a place, and, and ironically, it was the hunters who said there are really special places here that need to be in some way protected. And gradually, from 1924 onwards, there were sort of concepts of protection going on. So sort of, please don't come anywhere in here because well, agriculture stay there. That's enough. This place is special, and all over the Africa and the world, that sort of started to happen a bit more until the 50s where real national parks were created and established. And during the 60s, Uganda had, as you might imagine, with so much vegetation, water, lovely climate, so many animals, it was actually the most visited, Murchison Falls was the most visited park in Africa. It had the most mega herbivore, your, your elephants, buffaloes, giraffes, in any place in Africa. So most animals per square kilometer, if you like. And um, the parks were fantastic. And that was a time where anyone in any generation would have wished to have seen it. And, and my uncle was then warden in Murchison Falls. Um, we then went through the dark years of Uganda, the Ugandan history, and the genocide, the Idi Amin era. Um, and for 20, 30, 40 years, um, a, a place that didn't get investment, didn't have security, didn't have safety. It was chaos, really difficult. And the parks only really had 10 years of investment from 1960 to 1970, really. Now, that's not long enough for a 5,000 square kilometer park to be able to have road networks and be able to be organized, if you like. It's a lot of investment. So if you accelerate to the turn of the century, the millennium, we got relative peace from parks that had Lord's Resistance Army rebel activity until just 10, 15 years ago. All of a sudden they opened up again and tourism started to come in, but we only had the infrastructure that we had inherited from 1960, which is only covering about 3% of the park, but animals go everywhere. So how do we protect the 97% of the park? And, and during the period we lost so many animals 16,000 elephants down to a couple of hundred, all the rhino, including the northern white rhino, which is Murchison is their home. And um, the animal numbers and the distributions were decimated. 
So what we've been doing is to say, okay, fine. Um, how do we encourage support back in? This is not a popular place. It's not a famous place. We don't have famous people living in and around this area or owning land around this area. We have no network. We've got no friends out there. So how do we get this funding into where it's needed to be? And ultimately it comes down to the goodwill of organizations like IEF and characters like myself who rattle cages, ring bells, run marathons, do whatever we can to, to raise what little we can to get what we need in the right places. And the last 20 years has been a story of doing just that. And ultimately, what was the threat of agriculture taking the parks? That's where we used to have our ranger posts, stopping anyone coming any further, taking up any more of our park. So we have nothing outside of national parks anymore. It's all gone. We only have what's left in the national park or protected area system. So what we've been doing is now saying, well, our threat isn't people taking land for agriculture. Our threat is now the poaching. So we had to move our rangers away from the edges of the park and put them into the areas that really needed protection. We needed a permanent presence to make sure that that land, that landscape and those animals were permanently protected. And ultimately, there are lots of capabilities we've created, like veterinary capabilities or rangers being able to operate from boats to look after um, fishermen's uh, needs, whether there's an accident or making sure legal fishermen don't come in, or tourism is, is safe and sound. You know, there can be accidents. We must be able to have a capability to look after all the facets of an operation of a national park, not just, you know, looking after anim animals or or searching animals. There's an awful lot more that goes on and we had to be able to manage it all. So much of it is us trying to keep to grips with it all, with what we've got. Wow. So that, it's a long-winded long way of, of replying, but sorry. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, and that sort of takes us to a greater discussion of the Uganda Conservation Foundation and the work that you guys do. Um, so you talked a little bit about the wildlife and the different approaches, having to move from encroachments from agriculture to protecting the interior of the park and poaching. Uh, can you talk more about that? Uh, IEF has some pretty stunning photos of snares and traps, things that the team and rangers have pulled out. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about poaching the rangers, yeah. what their daily life is like. The genesis of the Uganda Conservation Foundation, I was originally working in southern Queen Elizabeth National Park, which borders Burunga National Park, which has had such a tragedy this last week. And we were in and out of that and setting up the, the rangers working together. And in those days, they weren't paid. They, they were always having nightmares with rebel activity. And I think there were 129 deaths during that, of rangers during that time when I was there. It was horrendous and no one cared. And it became very obvious to me, whilst I was running this project called the Elephants, Crops and People Project, that there were severe problems in areas where there just simply weren't people putting, well, the famous organizations, you might say, were not there. So there was a market failure, in my view, um, where there was no way to attract funding, manage it appropriately and carefully, um, and then disperse it carefully to the right projects to the, the things that really needed to happen they're not necessarily the what you might call the sexy things in 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 the world but you things that have to happen um and so we we were encouraged actually by a, another couple of wonderful organizations called tusk trust and, and david shepherd wildlife foundation to set up a structure so uganda had something and the simple premise was what if i if i get run over by a bus what next and yes, Mike, it's fine throwing money at you. We trust you. There's never an issue on that. But how do we scale up? Um, and, and there were very valid points. So we created this thing called the Uganda Conservation Foundation. And in time, that, so that, that was supported in the US by IEF. Um, and we worked together. So effectively, anything raised through the US goes through IEF. And it's a UK charity. And then op in, in operations, everything's in Uganda. And essentially, all we do is to help the Uganda Wildlife Authority in the background. They are brilliant at many things, but what they don't necessarily have is the reach to be able to attract funding, manage it, and disperse it, to raise funds. 
and to support where maybe any public sector organization struggles. We all know that civil services around the world struggle with procurement and whatever else. Well, here's a funny little organization that doesn't have to take six months to change a light bulb. We can do it right now. And, and that's a really big blessing for guys on the ground who maybe ha need new tires. And we can say, no problem. And we call Toyota Uganda or somebody. Can we have three tires or four tires? And can we get them on tomorrow? Yep, done. This funny little organization unlocks problems that the Uganda Wildlife Authority has every single day in multitudes. And it just means that the, the guys and the girls on the front line and the management of the Uganda Wildlife Authority have someone who's got their back to say, we're gonna, have, we're gonna help you succeed as you can. This is a, you, an Ugandan African governmental body who are perfectly capable of doing all this stuff. They just need the help. We don't have to do things for them. They know what they're doing. They just need the ability to do it. So yes, we have rangers now who are paid on time. They're paid competitive amounts. They get their health insurance. We've, we've um, got the British Army, the US military, UNODC and others training them to high standards of um, all aspects of work, whether it's being able to navigate and, and, and read maps or, or look after someone who's injured, whether it's themselves, a teammate or a community member, how to look after wildlife. Maybe the lions have been poisoned or something um, and how to look after that scene. Also to adhere to humanitarian um, international requirements. Human rights is massive. We've got laws within Uganda and we're all signed up to international laws as well. So everything we do is, is bringing in partners who would love to play a part in creating a greater success. That's the important thing. Lots of people who put their hands up and say, do you know what, I want to be part of something here. What can I do? I say, well, what have you got? I'm a lawyer. Okay, well, can you help us look at how we do this or how we do that? It might be prosecutions, it might be whatever it might be. But the answer is yes, you can help. Um, sometimes it's as coarse as we need cash. Sometimes it's a little bit more than that. So one way or another, we, we have in Murchison Falls, for instance, in Queen Elizabeth National Park, both have about 200 rangers, very active in a very tough job. Um, day and night, there are poaching communities um, or criminal gangs pushing all the time. And it's an incredibly dangerous, unforgiving um, job. Um, it, it's, it's one where the guys and girls on the front line must be um, led well, they must have high morale and they must be respected, bottom line. Um, if you don't look after them, it will all come down. And, and that's really where we've spent an awful lot of our time, making sure that they're not living in a tiny little mud hut after they get back from a patrol, when they're exhausted after five or six days, soaking wet, muddy, miserable, hungry, cold. They've now got a proper building with a light bulb. They can have clean water. They can wash their clothes. They've got what they need. Now, that's a lot of people don't realize just how much that means to the guys and the girls on the front, on the front line, that they, can, they, they are respected and people out there care. And, and really that's where IEF and, and other partners have stood up and said, it may not be sexy, but let's do it, let's get it done. And you look at the numbers of wildlife that has been bouncing back in Uganda, it is phenomenal. And it comes down to those boys and girls just going, do you believe in us? I'm, I'm motivated, let's do it. And they're amazing. Why wouldn't they be? <laughs> Very true. And you're right. One of the things we've learned from projects over the years is the more you invest in the communities and the people, the more you get back. So can you talk a little bit more about where these rangers come from? Are they people within the community who you've recruited? Are they uh, locals? Or, or how are their families involved? And what kind of needs do they have? Historically, you, you inherit your cohort of rangers. They come from the communities, they come from all over the country, different places that when the government does recruitment, it has to recruit through a, a national tabloid and people you know, put their names forward. But you also get a strong push from a national park, a region, um, asking communities to try as well. Now, recently we've brought in 
over the last three years, about a thousand rangers. Um, a lot of them come from the regions. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean they've come right next door to the park. Um, and more recently, unfortunately, it's just been cancelled. I might just add, we were about to, we we're about to, when I say we, the Uganda Wildlife Authority was about to do a recruitment for 500 rangers. And part of that was going to include a lot of youth from around the park boundaries, predominantly because we've been working with families around Murchison Falls and elsewhere um, and getting them through vocational colleges. Now, that was to make sure that they had a skill that was used or could be used and employed, not just a skill that floats away and they, they don't, what's the point of it all? Um, after a year of 100 of these kids, we had high hopes that after apprenticeships for about 50 odd of them, at least 20 or 30 of them had been accepted to join the entry course for, to be a ranger. Now, prior to that, the families they came from were very hard poaching families and families impacted by elephant crop raiding. So take one family member who then gets employed, it's cash in hand, that changes perspective, that changes a relationship. Um, and we, we've been working with these kids for the last year more. They are absolutely wanting to join the Ugandan Wildlife Authority and they are incredible ambassadors. So much so it's quite awkward for them to go home because they then confront the very people they know who are being naughty. And, but that's the conversation that I can't have with them. The current ranger can't have with those guys. And if they go back home and say, well, actually the Ugandan Wildlife Authority was honorable. They paid us on time, they fed us on time, they did exactly what they said they would do. They got us training, they got us apprenticeships, they got us jobs, and we believe in them. What they're doing is amazing. And honestly, conservation needs to have a different perspective. It's, it's wrong in conservation. What I mean by that is we should have a regional development perspective. The people who live in and around the parks, the industries that work within the parks, the fabrics of the economy, if you like, are how we should be looking at this. If there is no value for a local person in the park, and maybe they lose value because elephants crop raid or lions eat their cows, irrespective of that they're involved in illegal activity, if we don't solve those problems as a regional development perspective, we're never going to keep an elephant or a lion or whatever it is. There will be poisoning, there will be poaching, there will be whatever there is. As soon as we've got everybody working together, even if there's a collapse of one industry, there's enough strength in the others within that fabric to be able to hold things together. And then for us to react to support those that are not doing well. An example is we have the River Nile coming through Murchison Falls and it joins Lake Albert on the, on the western side and heads up to Egypt. But as it makes that bend, it goes through an area called the Delta. And that's the main tourism area where all of the snares that you've seen pictures of have, have really been removed. 34 metric tons over eight years have been removed from that area. And it is where 80% of our animals are. It's the 3% that was originally protected. The interesting thing there is that we've been working with the communities to look after the fishing industry. If you allow illegal fishermen all over the place, there are no fish left. If they fish illegally, unlicensed, or maybe their nets are the wrong size, or they, they clear all the breeding, important breeding areas, the whole fishing industry goes down. That's an awful lot of people in fishing villages remembering that our population is 80% under, under 20 years old. Sorry, sorry 70% is under 20 years old. The youth who are bored, they have nothing to do, they're hungry. Um, they're going to start to poach, and they were poaching. So the most important thing was to protect the industry of fishing. We can then, as we're now doing, work with the communities to say, right, you can't all be fishermen. What else is there? How do we engage you with other stuff? Some of you might want to become rangers. You might become some of the hundred, or ne next year another hundred. Ten of you might become rangers. Um, we've got to find the opportunities for them to be able to stabilize the threats coming from the park. So you're right, 100% right. It isn't just about law enforcement, it's about the communities, their livelihoods, it's about a regional development. Can we get guys and girls into the tourism industry? Sadly, it's collapsed because of COVID, 
but we needed cooks, waiters, mechanics, plumbers, thatchers, carpenters, electricians, drivers, tour guides, interpreters, whatever it is, accountants. Can we create things, even hairdressers? Mine's falling out, but you know, even I cut my hair sometimes. But the point is that can we engage demand-driven jobs into our partners, our family within the park? And that family is the community as well. Brilliant. The multifaceted approach, you can't separate the people from the conservation work and expect any sort of sustainable long-term gains. Um, That's 100% true. You must be able to manage and control the park first. Without the law enforcement in place, the management in place, you can't possibly win with the community. You have to have both in. You can't do one or other. Exactly. That is so smart. And so, okay, let's talk about the security aspects. I know IEF has supported the construction of a number of ranger posts over the years, both land and marine. So why don't we discuss those, those aspects of the work? As we mentioned a little bit earlier, our ranger posts used to be around the edges of the park to stop agriculture advancing into the park. We then had to redistribute them to make sure we had our ranger, law enforcement rangers, anti-poaching rangers, where the animals were in the landscapes that needed to be protected where their threats were, where the vulnerabilities were. So over the, the last eight years, the recovery of Murchison Falls National Park and actually Queen Elizabeth National Park has been effectively building ranger posts in the key places where we knew we could block poaching, whether it was a transit route or a, 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 a route where they move meat or ivory, or whether it was literally because if we protected that habitat, the animals would come back in a big way. And then, of course, you've got an opportunity to bring tourism to invest in the area. And that means jobs. And that means more and more eyes and ears on the ground and support to law enforcement. Everyone benefits at that point. Because we must also recognize in Uganda, we share 20 percent of our park entry um, revenues with communities. So if tourism goes up, the communities get more as well. And in the last eight years, it's moved from $50,000 to over $400,000 guaranteed every year. Now, that is something that is the Ugandan Wildlife Authority's golden ticket to be able to say, every year we can engage in a solid project with you, whether it's skill development or maternity ward or clean water. It is up to the district and local communities to come up with those plans. And, and the Ugandan Wildlife Authority can then go, here's the amount of money for the year, let's do it. So going back to the rangers and ranger posts, we've rebuilt 15 um, ranger posts we put in the first time ever if you like the foundations of park management there are basics you must have in place communications across the park until this year we didn't have any means to communicate across 90 percent of Murchison now that means that if there is an, a ranger injured like we've had many times or there's an operation that's going wrong or needs assistance for any reason we don't know and often that meant the rangers would have to move 70 to 100 kilometers on foot to get to a patrol site, start, do the patrol, and walk all the way back as well. If something had happened, like obviously it can happen, we're living in a very dangerous environment, you're in trouble. And that brings lives into, into the question. So communications had to go in. We've been putting in the digital radio network, which is now operational. And um, we've been providing veterinary capability. So where there are animals caught in snares or whatever the risk is, we are able to send a Ugandan Wildlife Authority vet with the dark guns, with the drugs, with the various kit in um, a veterinary response unit car, all supplied by UCF and supported by IEF, I might add as well. And they have their own lab. So they are able to respond within a matter of minutes to a problem. A hotline can be reached. Anyone can just sweep the area looking around, find an animal, and they can respond. Now, there used to be five to six animals, whether it's an elephant, a lion, a giraffe, a rare Rothschild's giraffes or whatever, that would be caught up in a snare a day. And unfortunately, the vets would be watching them die, and it would be heartbreaking for everybody. Nothing. They could do nothing. Now they're able to save them. Probably, I don't know what the success rate is, but it must be over 90%. And because of that, the Ugandan Wildlife Authority, through law enforcement and the veterinary department, 
have managed to get the Rothschilds giraffes from 400 to over 2,000. That's not bad going. The Uganda cobs have gone over 146,000 from 70,000. It's an incredible recovery, and the distribution has been wonderful. And it's highly likely that if we can sustain this effort, we will double the lion population of Uganda. Now, the Joint Operations Command Center is, is basically the hub. It's where all of the radio communications and other communications come back to, and the decision makers, the officers, wardens, if you like, are able to say, Tom, Dick, and Harry are in trouble in this sector. Send a car to go and help them. Or we've heard, we've just had a, a call coming in about a, an elephant or a giraffe that's in, in, been seen that's injured. Veterinary response, go. We will support you with a law enforcement team as well. Off you go. Whatever it is, whether it's a, even if a tourism car crashes, rolls over, which does happen a lot, sadly, we're able to send an engineering team, a medic, and law enforcement to the site, assess the site, look after it, and move on. And that's where this Joint Operations Command Center is brilliant. We have what we call Earth Ranger, which is part of Paul Allen's Vulcan. Um, it has been a program that's developed to support protected area management across Africa, been developed by lots and lots of wonderful practitioners across Africa in, in, in incredible parks and, and conservancies. And we've just introduced it into Murchison. And it means that we can see where our rangers are through the digital radios and other signals as well. And we are able to real time manage our park. We've never been able to do that. Operationally, totally different. Um, guys and girls can contact us from anywhere, they, whether they've seen something or whether they want something verified or they want support or they, whatever's going on, they need food, goodness me, anything. It, it could be elephants crop raiding. The community conservation department would be able to deploy a cargo and support it straight away from wherever that's necessary and whether the cars are based. The teams are now reactionary and preventative. The ranger posts are preventative. We're in this area, we're protecting this area, don't come and poach, we are here, but they still will try. And where an observation team finds them, they can then call units to come in and make sure safely the incident is resolved. Um, and then it can be taken through the legal courts and sorted out professionally and all with the humanitarian things looked after completely. And that's the big thing is professionalizing um, the Uganda Wildlife Authority's ability to work and they are and enabling them to be as successful as they can be. Those are real tangible conservation gains that that I think everyone should be extremely proud of. That is incredible. Um, can you tell us a little bit more moving forward, say for 2020, assuming COVID doesn't completely eliminate the ability to do projects and move forward? What are the plans for progress right now? It's tough. We're all on lockdown. That means tourism, well, everyone knows that tourism has collapsed. I might as well, you know, that's the elephant in the room, pardon the pun. Um, it is a nightmare for everyone across Africa. In our business model for the Uganda Wildlife Authority, 95% of our operational funding, in other words, anything from paying a ranger, feeding a ranger, keeping a car moving, fixing a car, anything like that, 95% of it came from tourism. There is no tourism now. So the executive director of the Uganda Wildlife Authority, a wonderful man, Sam Wanda, he made it very clear to everyone that we've got until July. At that point, at the end of July, we can't feed, pay, and move our rangers around. Um, we will continue. Don't have any, um, uh, any, any question of that. The resilience of the Uganda Wildlife Authority staff is strong. They will, they will need help. Um, they're, they're not going to give up. Don't worry about that. They, and they never do. The rangers across Africa are remarkable people, um, and the wardens too. Um, but we must get behind them wherever we can to, to give them that boost and morale. To answer your question, what are we doing? Um, we have a serious issue going on in the northeast of Murchison Falls National Park um, in an area called Iago and Atil Camp. And there's some quite, it's the area of Murchison, there's one other as well, 
where criminal gangs are heavily armed, um, they're pretty brutal, and they're not scared of a fight. Um, it is an area which is a worry for us, and because of that, we've, we've said we're going to put in two big ranger posts there. We need to bolster our numbers there and tell them we've got a permanent presence. This is not an area to come into. None of the national parks you can come into, protected areas rather. So we will be building um, in the next four to five months um, an eight-man ranger post in Atil camp, and we will be adding a six-man block to Iago 3, which is right, it's all on the northeast of, of Murchison Falls. That makes a, a significant increase in the permanent-based rangers in the area. We then have our mobile unit who will go through the area on operations supporting the guys who are permanently there, but it does mean that we have very professional um, teams there to patrol the areas, make sure the crime is reduced. And, and ultimately, if we can sort out the Northeast through the IEF funding, which we've got coming in soon, incredible. We have a big issue at the moment with, with not, be, not having cars to move people. Um, whether we have about two to three law enforcement cars covering 5,000 square kilometers. Um, that's to make sure everyone has food continuously, make sure they've got water, make sure that they, they're, they're taken on for leave or returned or they're being deployed on patrols or those same cars also go to the local courts, three different districts. So it's actually two cars and one old one, which we provide, which provided an old Land Cruiser that's done over 900,000 kilometers um, and still limping along. It, it's our big problem. Um, the Northeast we'll solve this year, but we've got to get our teams mobile. And, and that comes down to the jock having a car where we can say there's been a reported incident of, let's say, a lion and a snare. There's been another reported incident of 14 elephants crop raiding another incident of a tourist vehicle that's gone down and maybe even a, a tourism boat that's that's stuck um all teams have got to go all require vehicles and all afterwards and during the same time will be bouncing between is the car operable is someone going to court how many court sessions have we got today because each courtroom is 100 kilometers away so that's 200 kilometers there and back so that takes a car out for a whole day, which means no operations. Um, so you see our continual stress of who's got the car? Can we do something? Oh, we can't move. Do we have to walk 100 kilometers to do this? All right, let's do it. But it isn't professional now. Um, but that is what's going on. So we're desperately fundraising to be able to, to be professional, which is what the world wishes we were. Um, but if you see the sweat and tears that goes on, um, just to try to do the basics, it's it's extraordinary. And as you know, Sergeant Alfred O'Dyer died last week. He died falling off the back of a Land Cruiser after a patrol in the northeast in Attil Camp, driving back. He'd had two contacts with gun uh, with armed poachers, so he, he survived that. And no one hurt, killed, but he died falling off the back of a vehicle because we haven't even got seats in the vehicles. I mean, come on, this is the best ranger we've got in the whole of Uganda. And he died falling off the back as they went around a corner, moving away from a giraffe that crossed the road. I mean, ridiculous. Um, what can I say? It, it's, it, we, we, we're always up against it. Everyone in parks are. We're not unique, but we're starting with no relationships, no networks, no, no reserves. It's just little old us. <laughs> So. I think people in the West don't realize how much is done by your teams, by the, by the government rangers with so little resources. They accomplish so much and yet there's so much more that, that we can do to help them to make it easier and to make things more efficient and like you say, more professional. Um, the, the amount of need is always going to outpace what what we have if you if you look at where we've come from where we've got to there's an extraordinary change it's incredibly positive um and you look at the quality of the the rangers yes 10 15 years ago 
we had serious problems with rangers poaching that's not a problem now it's gone they're motivated they've got new young rangers so all of those collusions all those problems are now sort of in the past we've got a, a wonderful group of, of guys and girls working in all sorts of sectors of or functional areas if you like of the uganda wildlife authority and yeah we 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 firefight problems every single day, um, whether it's elephant crop raiding. We've got a team right now trying to follow six lions that have wandered out of the park into an area that used to be wilderness, but in the last five years has been taken to agriculture. Now, if we don't get to those lions, they will be poisoned. That's the end of it. Um, we, we are really worried about the lion population in Uganda, really worried. Um, the elephants need help. They are doing well. That needs to be looked after. Lions, oh, they are in trouble. Um, we need to protect their habitats. We need to be able to respond to a problem like this. Um, we recently held a, a, a course from a wonderful man from South Africa who came up teaching guys what to do about when there's a poisoning incident. When a, a cattle man or someone puts a poisoned cow down, you don't just lose few lions or 30 lions, you lose the jackals, the, all of the vultures, the vultures across Africa are down by 95%. You, you lose the birds, the insects, the, everything goes on and the rangers are terrified about touching the carcass. Is it gonna kill them? So we didn't have any money to do this. We've got a little bit of money paid, only a little bit. We, we, we flew the guy up, one Andre Boto is the name, lovely guy, been in Kruger for years and he held courses in Murchison and Queen Elizabeth National Parks and it was brilliant but this is the sort of tangible work that needs to happen build the ranger post put the radios in get the cars train the rangers get everybody it's tangible it's real um and we we have a thousand problems every day and if we can gradually go through them we will win <laughs> we, we're winning already but it just uh, takes quite a lot of energy and resolve that's the right attitude to have you got a thousand problems, but we'll keep chugging away at them and we'll win. Um, and I think that's probably the attitude that brought you to be so recognized. I mean, you're an MBE. That's a pretty huge honor. Um, can, you talk surprise. <laughs> <laughs> can you talk about how that came about uh, and what that experience was like? Yeah, um, there are not many in the world i think everyone will recognize there are heroes out there who i'm not calling myself one of the heroes though but um who who maybe don't get thanked the celebrities get thanked maybe but not the here, real heroes the people behind the scenes the guys who are getting their hands dirty and for 20 years yeah i, I was working doing my jolly best um and i suddenly got a telephone call from um, the British High Commission here asking if I would like to accept this award um, from the Queen and, and I was somewhat taken aback. Uh, I'm not someone who likes to be in the limelight. I, I'm quite happy doing public speaking and all of that, you know that, but I'm not someone who, who searches for fame or anything like that and I did find it awkward. I didn't find it an easy thing to, to tell people I talk about even now. Uh, my mother was in floods of tears and, you know, wonderful. She thinks I'm the best son in the world, which, of course, I am. My, other, my brother's useless. Um, <laughs> far from it. Um, but, yeah, we went to Buckingham Palace, and it was a time when I was giving a lecture at the Royal Geographical Society, and I'd insisted that that was done with one of my greatest friends, uh, who's the Deputy Director of Conservation at uh, Field Operations, sorry, at the Uganda Wildlife Authority, Charles Tomwesage. We shared the stand at the... At the um, at the Royal Geographical um, Society doing their, the Tusk Annual Lecture. And then the next day, went to Buck he, he came to Buckingham Palace with me, as did our chair lady of, of the Uganda Conservation Foundation, and my mother, of course. And um, yes, um, uh, Duke of Cambridge, Prince William, gave me the award, and it was uh, very humbling. It was very nice, and um, it was nice to be thanked. Um, it was a real thank you. So. You don't, we don't get paid for what we do, quite why we do it. My wife will question that forever. Um, but it was one of the most wonderful thank yous. That's fantastic. And so well-deserved. That is a wonderful thank you. And I'm sure the, the bragging rights you get with your mom is worth 
worth it more than most. <laughs> I'm trying to get away with as much as I can, but she's canny. She, she can see straight through me. Every mother can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think people should know about? Anything about conservation or elephants or what life is like actually out there doing the work? I think, I think the thing I'd like to just bring to people's awareness is the importance of the whole network, the support network. Yes, I'm on the ground and I support the Ugandan Wildlife Authority with our team and we support with our projects. I can't do anything if it isn't for people like you. And I'm looking at you, Sarah, and Debbie, and not just you two and the guys who work for IEF, but the people who donate to IEF, who the zoos who are involved, the friends of the zoos, the friends of whoever you are. And unfortunately, we never get to meet you all. And I hope one day I can go across and see you all. But nothing can be done out here without you. The link between the what I might call ex situ guys from us, the, 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 the guys in, who might be in America or Europe or Australia to us all is so important. We are just one part of this support network, but we're on the ground. It does not work without you. Nothing will happen without you and we will lose without you. So my, my plea to everyone is please get behind IEF, not just our project, but all the others as well. Please support your local zoos and, and, and efforts being made to promote the, the, what's going on across the world and to educate people and to support funds getting to important projects wherever they are around the world. Um, I generally think that the smaller the project the, or, the, or the organization, the more impactful it is. Um, that's my experience after 20 something years of it all and being a, my previous job in the middle when I said in London, I was a Deloitte strategist in London. Um, I kind of think of things in, in, in economic and business terms now and the impact is with those smaller organizations and there are some brilliant ones out there. So anyway, the important thing is none of this happens without you guys. Um, and thank you from all of us out here, the Uganda Wildlife Authority, all of the rangers, everyone in UCF, communities who could never probably meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. That, those are some extremely kind and sweet words. And I know that all of our personnel and donors and everyone at IEF is so incredibly proud to be able to support your work. Every time Debbie goes to visit or anyone sees the work that's being done, it, it energizes us for months and months to come just knowing that kind of impact that you guys are having and that IEF's donors are having through you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate your time and we look forward to working with you for many years to come. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you.